Have you ever wondered what you would see driving the back roads of Wisconsin? What's your expectation? Is it cows, fields, rows upon rows of corn? Or do you expect to find towns so small that you dare not blink lest you miss the flash of a house outlined in pink set against the rays of a lowering sun? Though you'd be right in saying these are all true, you're sadly mistaken if you think there's nothing more left to discover here than a few old Bessies standing by, waiting to greet you with a moo. Dollar Lane. All this time we've been living on the wrong street, Marty. Living on Dollar Lane. Yeah. At least we'd have some money. Hey Sightseers, Sightseen Sally here and... Marty. Today we're taking another drive. We're over in northeastern Wisconsin, closer to the lake shore. Uh, what would you say? 10 miles from the lake. Yeah, 10 miles from the lake. We're taking some back roads, checking out some countryside towns, places that you probably wouldn't normally end up in unless you had a reason to go there, just because these are towns that are probably less likely to show up on any kind of tourist destination or it's just a man a few words Ayo. <laughs> just like marty said tourist destinations these aren't your normal tourist destinations and we're just being nosy seeing what we can find on these back roads maybe kind of forgotten towns our first stop is here in michicot where we were ogling the dollar lane. I imagine you need to have a pretty to live over in dollar lane, huh? Not us. Nope. It'd be low budget lane if we lived on it. <laughs> At least that's what all our neighbors think. <laughs> With all the junk in the yard. From up here, you can get a good view of Michicot. You can see this is their main street that runs along here. And then next to it, on the other side of those trees, is a river. To my left is the Michicot Country Store. And then where we're parked is right over there. And then right here where I'm standing is up in the cemetery which according to its sign was established in 1844, meaning there are some older graves up here in the cemetery. If you look at the grave that's in front of me here, you can see this one is from the early 1900s. And then this headstone over here is from somebody who passed away in 1899. You'll notice compared to the cemeteries that we perused when we were out west, the ones here in the Midwest are considerably different. Besides having green grass and being surrounded by trees, here in the Midwest, the headstones are quite remarkably different than many of the graves that you would see out in the desert. To me, because so many of the graves out west are marked with simply a cross, a wooden cross in the ground, it tends to give the impression that the graves here aren't necessarily as old, when in reality, that's probably not the case because there were people settling here roughly about the same time, maybe even sooner than they were out west. I don't know what the reason is for the difference other than perhaps it's because here you had more immigrants settling in, putting down roots, whereas out west, it was likely you had more transients because they were all looking to strike it rich with the gold rush. Along with that, then if you were transient and looking to make it big on gold, perhaps you didn't have very much money. Thus, when you died, all you could afford was a simple cross in the ground or maybe nothing even at all. Whereas the immigrants who settled here probably had more economic stability and could afford something a little bit more extravagant. During colonial times, grave markers, if used, were simple usually fashioned out of field stones or wooden planks. Later, as burial practices evolved, etched headstones became more common, with early ones being made out of sandstone or slate 
as these materials were easy to quarry and carve. Often deemed as a sign of wealth, headstones were originally reserved for the upper and middle classes. Generally speaking, the more money one had, the more elaborate the grave marker. Well, looky here, we've got a little bit of information as to how the cemetery actually got started here. According to the sign, in 1844, a man by the name of Daniel Smith and his wife Elizabeth and their six children came up the river from Two Rivers to establish the sawmill. One of his daughters, Mary Ann, who was age 22, died. While the cause of her death isn't known, the family decided to bury her up on the hill overlooking the sawmill that was down by the river. Then the following year, Mary Ann's sister Melissa also died. She ended up being buried next to her sister. Eventually, the rest of the Smith family died and was buried here. And then the cemetery was turned over to Michicot. And the rest, as they say, is history. Interestingly enough, Smith was also responsible for naming the town after Chief Michicot a Potawatomi Indian leader who lived in the area. This sign, by the way, talks about what happened to the Potawatomi and how they ended up relocating to the Cedar River area in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Of particular interest is that a band of them had lived, oh, about eight miles north of the Smith Mill until 1862, but then due to unpaid property taxes were forcibly removed from the property by the Kiwanee County Sheriff. Being up here in the Northwoods of Wisconsin, there is a lot of history associated with the Native Americans. I typically, you know, if I can touch on it a little bit, I will. But given today's political climate, some people might be offended because I'm not Native American. And because of that, I try to be mindful of what I say and in the end, probably don't talk enough about it, but you know, it's a tough balancing act. Interestingly enough, if you look up on their water tower, you can see they have an Indian chief or a Native American chief painted on the side of it. At one time, the sports teams were named the Michigan Indians, though they may still be. I don't know that for sure. Moving on, you can see we've moved ourselves down to the other end of Main Street. As you can see, there's a real spectacular looking mural painted on the side of this building, commemorating Chief Michicot, no doubt. There's a number of historic buildings here in town. You've got the old state fake circa 1910 with its night depository being now used as Pathways Photography Studio. Not only that, for a while it served as the Mishkot Village Town Hall. And then next door to the bank is this fine old building, long known as River Edge Galleries, home to fine arts and antiques. This building was built in 1905 and was originally a meat market. Though you wouldn't know it from looking at it today, there was even a slaughterhouse that was a part of it. And back in the day, you could purchase an entire hog for only $3 and an entire cow for only 15 Though this building once housed Janice Wiegert's School of Dance, it was originally known as Terrence Hardware Store with a buggy and carriage shop and a museum on the second floor. They must have enjoyed bringing oddities to the village because at one time there was even a collection of rare and exotic animals behind the building. And then over here on the corner at what used to be known as the Cozy Corner Cafe was once a hotel with a bar called the Badger State House. By the way, I just love it when you have the towns doing all the legwork for you on their history. I'm going to show you this one last building and then we're going to move on because I hadn't anticipated on learning all about Michicot's history just from their downtown. Otherwise, I would have planned on just focusing this entire video on Michicot. It's the historic opera house and one of the largest of its kind in the county when it was built at the turn of the century. 
According to the sign, the dance hall was built first. Later, living quarters were added so they could take in boarders and overnight guests. And they even had an elegant ice cream parlor that they added where they served homemade ice cream. Pretty interesting. Who would have thought? By the way, if some of you thought that the streets of Michigan looked familiar, that's because it appeared in a Netflix original called Making a Murderer. Yep. For those of you wondering, we're now traveling on County Highway B. That's a really? <laughs> You know I'm going to have to bleep that out, right? <laughs> you might have to take some extra nitro off laughing so hard. <laughs> what could I say? Maybe I liked it better when he was being a man of few words. We're coming up on a little town known as Tish Mills. But before we get there, I wanted to show you something that hiking people will totally appreciate. And that's the Ice Age Trail. Or at least the Tish Mills segment of this National Scenic Trail. And apparently a part of it is known as Weber's Woods. I'm not going to go much further than this just because the mosquitoes are horrid right now and I'm not exactly dressed for hiking. Ladies and gents, I give you Tish Mills home of Third Eye Yoga Studio, which if I recall correctly, used to be a bank. And then there's Fat Boys, a local tavern, the Little Sandwich Theater, AKA the historic Forest Inn, and this now empty building, which if I remember correctly, that used to be an old grocery store. Straddling two counties, Manitowoc and Kiwani, Tish Mills is a small hamlet located northeast of Michicot. Named for one of its early settlers, Charles Tisch, who erected a mill in the 1860s, Tisch Mills prides itself in having no mayor or city council. And you can see that their fire department has one of those sirens that Marty's longing to get. And that's pretty much Tisch Mills in a nutshell. Nothing too exciting going on here. Right, Marty? Nope. Now I know for some of you, that last stop over in Tish Mills was probably the least exciting town you've ever been. Like Marty. Absolutely. Although I thought I heard him saying something about a bar, stopping in a bar. Crazy eight bar. Crazy eight bar? What'd you do at the crazy eight bar? Drank soda and ate candy bars. Probably was 10 years old. What? What were you doing at a bar when you were 10? My lunatic uncle brought me there so he could play sheep head. Nice. Now, it explains a lot. Now we know. <laughs> yeah, I had a colorful childhood. <laughs> now we know. As much fun as it would be to recreate Marty's childhood, we're gonna move on to our next stop, which if I know you sightseers, you're gonna love because there's something unique that you can get only here in Stangleville. And that's this building here. You can see it has the old tin wrapped around the front the old leaded glass windows, and a pile of bricks, all waiting to be scooped up by the next person to own it. That's right, sightseers, you could be the next person to own a little bit of Wisconsin history. Looks like it needs a lot of work though. Too much for this old gal. But that's not really why I dragged you all out here to Stangleville. There's one other place I want to show you, and that is this hidden little gem, Connup's Meat Market. They have some of the best beef sticks and sausages that you'll ever find 
here in northeastern Wisconsin. For those doubters among us, you'll see that the first ingredient is beef, along with some pork, cheddar, and jalapeno. You happy now, Marty? You got some beef sticks to snack on later? Does that make up for having to drive out to Tish Mills and Stangleville out in the middle of nowhere? Not really. <laughs> I guess it does. Just as we thought we'd seen it all, Marty spotted something alongside the roadway. No, don't drive off, Marty. Them poor things are scared. There's mom's missing. He won't let me get another dog. What do you think the chances are of letting me have a pet raccoon? You want rabies? I know, but I feel so bad for them. They're just sitting there by the road. I know Marty's right. They're wild animals and they should stay wild. But my 10 year old self, who dragged home a baby chipmunk hidden in her sweatshirt and tried to keep it a secret from her parents because she felt bad and found it in the woods abandoned, would have gone and rescued them raccoons. Just saying. Run, Bambi, run! At least we kept Bambi safe this time around. It's a given. Driving along the back roads in this state, you're going to encounter plenty of cows, farm fields, and places so small you can barely call them towns. Take it from me, though. You better keep your eyes open and stop for those things we like to call hidden gems. Otherwise, You'll miss out on all the good stuff. Until next time, this is Sightseeing Sally.